and everything yeah. to the uh, attendees and then we will start. Correct. Correct. So very good evening, everyone. We uh, are extremely sorry that due to some technical glitch, uh, we are starting late, but we will, we will compensate the time. So as you know that today we are, uh, the topic of the masterclass is dealing with the difficult themes in science videos. And I am, I'm, I'm really privileged that I am introducing uh, Dr. C.M. Nautyal, Program Consultant, uh, Science Communication, Indian National Science Academy, New Delhi to you. Uh, Dr. Uh, Chandra Mohan Nautyal is a well-known name in science communication and has been an integral part of national science communication scene for over 25 years. He has been a career scientist for about 40 years and having been at prestigious institutes like IIT Roorkee for MSc, PRL Ahmedabad for doctoral and postdoctoral research. This uh, was followed by over three decades of Birbal Sand Institute of Paleo Sciences, Lucknow from where he uh, super, uh, he had a radio uh, carbon lab, uh, uh, widely traveled in India and abroad for his 850 lectures on science and science communication and research presentations. Dr. Nautial is a recipient of over a dozen honors, including INSA Medal for Young Scientists. He has been honored for research as well as science communication. His association with radio and TV is more than a quarter century long. He has been associated with about 200 programs on science, including many documentaries. As one who understands science and media both. He has also been jury in two science film festivals and is also associated with IISF since 2016 as expert, organizer, or both. He, he scripts and re research for several media organizations, um, uh, organizing science events, gives voiceover, interviews, gets interviewed, and comment. Uh, several documentaries and other TV programs of his were telecast this year also. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Nautyal, uh, for uh, accepting our uh, request and, 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 and uh, uh, deciding to do this masterclass. Uh, but before uh, we go uh, for the masterclass, I have a, a question for you, like uh, what what was the thing that uh, uh, leads you to uh, take science communication uh, uh, as a field? Uh, and what, what, according to you, what is the current scenario of science communication in India? Okay, uh, thank you for a very kind uh, introduction. Uh, I'm Mr. Sabisachi. Uh, the first part of the question is uh, what brought me or what took me to science communication. Well, uh, I was a laboratory scientist all along, uh, but what happened once in 1988, it's something very interesting. Uh, I, was, uh, uh, I was at Indian National Science Academy in New Delhi. Uh, that was the day of 4th of October, and uh, we were supposed to go to the Rashtrapati Bhavan for uh, a lunch. So between the award and the lunch, there was a short time. So some uh, reporters from, uh, uh, a radio station of New Delhi, they approached us. They wanted us to talk something about the research work of ours, which uh, uh, for which we, we had got our awards. And then they said that we would like you to speak in Hindi. Now, as it turned out, I was the only person there who agreed to speak in Hindi. I had never been to any radio station before that. And that day I did it, and I think I did it pretty uh, well. Uh, that aroused a kind of interest. And when I came back to Lucknow from Delhi, uh, after, a, after a month or two months, I received a letter from All India Radio Lucknow uh, to come and give a talk. And that's how it all started. So from 1990 or so, 19, yeah, it was in 1990 that I started uh, speaking for them. And then I was invited to uh, television center uh, for some interviews. So I was being interviewed. But after that, the producer asked me if I would like to uh, interview other people also, because they said, we don't have many people who can speak Hindi so well and uh, that too uh, on science. So I happily agreed and that is how the journey started. 
So after that, I have been constantly in touch with them and uh, many channels uh, of radio and uh, television I have been doing that. And the second part of your question is, what is the scenario, present scenario? Uh, I think uh, at present, uh, science communication in our country is in a very good state. There are three very big organizations, Vigyan Prasad and CSTC and NISCARE, who are very actively involved in promoting science. All three are kind of government organizations. In addition to that, with the support of NCSTC, DST, uh, there are a lot of uh, NGOs in the country uh, who were brought together through the efforts of late Dr. Narendra Kesahegala Kalinga Awardee. And as a result, something like 70 of them are connected to NCSTC network. In addition, uh, there is an All India People's Network uh, in the southern part of India. Uh, they are also working. Uh, in West Bengal, in many other states, we have very active groups who are working for uh, science communication. So I think at present, the scenario is very good. Uh, there is a lot of support from the government and uh, people are enthusiastic. However, how efficiently uh, we are performing, uh, I think there is always a, a chance uh, for improvement. So we all should be trying and heading towards that. So I feel good about the science communication scenario in the country. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Nautial. Uh, uh, before Dr. Nautial sta uh, started his presentation, I will request uh, not to, uh, uh, in the chat box, do not uh, put your name or your personal information or email ID. And at the end of uh, the presentation, after uh, the presentation is over, Dr. Nautial will certainly address the questions which will be there. So for asking any question, you can write it in the chat box itself and no need to raise hands or anything. Uh, so uh, Dr. Nautilal, the floor is yours, um, dealing with difficult themes in science videos. Uh, thank you, uh, Sabizachi Ji. Uh, the theme for today's lecture that has been given to me is dealing with science themes in uh, science video. Sounds. Okay, hello, can you hear yeah. me now? Yes. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you. So uh, first thing that comes to our mind is why do we call certain themes difficult? Of course, in general, uh, people believe that uh, science is difficult. Can you see the screen? Yes, uh, sir, we can see a screen. Can you, uh, can you put it on the presentation? Yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Okay. Uh, so uh, first question is, uh, what, why do we consider it difficult? First thing is, of course, uh, believe to, uh, people believe that science is a difficult subject and uh, people underst don't understand it very easily. In particular, there are certain science uh, concepts which are a bit too difficult, they're too abstract, and uh, people don't understand them very easily. But what are the other problems that can come apart from the subject? There can be problems related to picturization. Sometimes picturizing something for a science documentary or a science program is rather difficult. Another problem is describing some principles of science can be difficult. Uh, one is the problem of vocabulary or terminology. And second is that since most of us study science in another language, in foreign language, uh, for example, English. Uh, so when it comes to the regional language, it becomes a bit difficult. We don't uh, find the good words. We fumble for the right term and so on. Another thing is that most of the research material which is available, it's uh, available uh, in the English language or German language or French language but very little uh, in uh, our regional languages. So unavailability of information in our language is a problem. Even otherwise, for Indian institution, it's not very easy to get information. Uh, in the foreign countries, most of the organizations have websites which are updated, which are very good, and which are regularly maintained. But that's not the case uh, with institutions in our country. Another problem is there are many fields which are very modern and nobody in India is working on them. Now, for example, uh, people are interested in the issues related to gravity and the government has allotted a lot of funds. I think uh, 
few hundred crores of rupees. But earlier, there were very few people working and they were working in collaboration with the foreign uh, uh, groups and uh, they used to interact with them. But in India, hardly anybody uh, knew about that. So unavailability of the experts is another problem. Then sometimes uh, the place may be such where the event is happening. For example, it may be a launching of a satellite. It may be a volcano. It may be some other natural event and uh, that may not be very easily accessible. Another thing is when we try to think of uh, photographing or shooting the experiments in the laboratory, then sometimes the processes are risky and the people are afraid to do that. And sometimes, of course, in our country, uh, there are problems like the issues can become very sensitive uh, for regions which have nothing to do with science. They may be religious, they may be political, or they may be other. So keeping these things in view, uh, we understand that uh, making documentaries on science limits us and efforts are needed uh, so that we uh, do it better. The most important thing for anybody who is interested in uh, making a science documentary or any kind of science program, particularly for the audiovisual media uh, like uh, television, uh, he has to decide or she has to decide on which topic the work is to be done. Then a decision has to be taken what would be the target audience. I will come to this matter of target audience very soon again. Then which is the language? As I told you in the beginning, uh, most of the scientists study in uh, English language. When it comes to talking in the regional language, it becomes a problem for them. And uh, people don't understand English language, whereas scientists cannot so efficiently communicate in the regional languages or Hindi language. The most important thing I think for any science filmmaker is to understand the purpose and the audience. The tone of the film will be decided for what purpose it's made. It is something like uh, what Ignu does for teaching science to the students? Is it something which informs people of some new incident or some new event or some new phenomenon? Or is it an advice to people on any particular disease such as uh, for COVID-19 these days? So depending upon the purpose, the script will be written and the film will be made. In case of documentary, one more important thing is that uh, you cannot anticipate everything. You cannot uh, script it completely in advance. In fact, uh, one person went to the extent of saying, and I think it was in one of the focal books, that person went to the extent of saying that uh, nobody writes the script of a documentary. It keeps on getting written as you go and talk to people. This has some merit uh, because you cannot predict everything how the documentary is going to unfold. Then one should also think about the content. Uh, there are many uh, things which are available in the literature. And from there, we have to take the material, compile it in one place and use it for writing the script. We have to decide on the format. Uh, is it going to be like a docudrama? Is it going to be a documentary? Is it going to be in the form of drama? Is it going to be like uh, talking heads where people would sit at the dais and talk to each other? Or is it going to be a recording of a lecture? And this come, reminds me uh, that in 2006, uh, two, uh, three great scientists of India, uh, Professor Siena Rao, Dr. Marshelkar, and Dr. Vijayan, all Padma awardees, and Professor Rao, as you know, is uh, now Bharat Ratna. These three scientists came to Lucknow, and the vice chancellor uh, asked me, he said, uh, why don't we uh, uh, keep a record of this, these lectures? Fine, we got some grants, and we did that. But the special thing we did was we recorded these lectures and kept them as such. But in the beginning of each lecture, we recorded something like uh, 10 minutes uh, about those uh, speakers, about their work, about their awards and honors. So that way we made a capsule of about one hour for each speaker and it became very special and it became very popular. So what I feel is that sometimes the speakers are so good, you don't have to touch the lecture, leave it raw. But in the beginning, you must provide the perspective. You must provide some background to the theme of the lecture, some introduction to the speaker, his achievements, so, so that when people listen to that lecture uh, uh, through DVD or uh, whichever way, uh, they understand that they are listening to somebody who is a specialist and they do also get 
some background to understand the following lecture. Then comes the question of language. Uh, I feel that if science is to be communicated to common people, then uh, this, uh, this has to be done very carefully. This has to be done in the, um, our own Indian languages. English, in the scientific circles, people understand. But as far as the common man is concerned, it's an alien language. So we should do as much as possible science communication in our own Indian languages. Now, uh, I told you that sometimes the topics can be very difficult. Uh, the abstract and the new topics are unfamiliar to the people and therefore people are afraid of uh, learning anything about them. Uh, you, you may recall that a few years ago, uh, there was a lot of talk about God particle, Higgs boson, and uh, Higgs also got Nobel Prize for that. Uh, this particle was termed God particle, which scientists did not like which Higgs himself did not like, and he didn't like it to be called Higgs boson either. But in the very beginning, it was very difficult to explain to people what actually Higgs boson is. Now we know Higgs boson is a particle which is responsible for the attribute of mass in the particle. If it were not there, then things won't have mass and the universe would be very, very different thing. Similarly, there is another concept of black hole. Black hole has been talked about for many years, uh, more than five decades. In fact, uh, Professor uh, Chandrasekhar, uh, the Indian uh, person, uh, he was a nephew of uh, Professor C.V. Raman, and he got Nobel Prize also. Uh, he also worked in this field. And 40 years ago, uh, there was an American magazine by the name Mercury, and that Mercury published a completely dark black cover page and as an introduction, they wrote that this is the first ever photograph of a black hole. Now, it took people some time to understand that this was a joke. This was an issue of 1st of April. And they said that this was their way of uh, uh, doing you know, the April Fool business. Uh, but uh, people really laughed it off. We didn't really have a black hole photograph. But then the question came, how is that we uh, knew what a black hole was or where it was. This is because black hole cannot be seen. Black hole is black hole because it has such a strong gravitational field, it does not allow any kind of radiation to escape it. And if its radiation is not escaping, we won't be able to see. It. But it also has another property. This is very dense, very massive. This attracts everything towards it. And in that process, when the charged particles are also there, they're going there, they're accelerated. In the process, they emit some radiation, but that is at quite a distance away from the black hole and that can escape there. And this is how what you see here, uh, uh, red uh, ring kind of thing here, reddish ring, orangish ring, uh, the colors are uh, artificial. And this is how we got the photograph of a black hole. So black hole has now been photographed, but this is a topic which is not very easy to explain. Uh, so this people find difficult. And if you really want to visualize it, uh, there was a film by name Interstellar in which they have uh, taken help from the scientists to show uh, what black hole was. And uh, as I saw the interview of a scientist uh, on the net, uh, he said that it was a pretty good depiction of what black hole really looks like. So if the concept is new, if the idea is not familiar to the people, uh, this can be termed a difficult theme and a lot of efforts will be needed uh, to write this script and then to show it on the screen. Similarly, there is an issue of relativity. Uh, it's supposed to be a very difficult concept. Uh, there is a virus. Virus is difficult because, and this is something really strange as you know, this is neither living nor dead. Bacteria is living and virus is not only smaller than bacteria, uh, this is dead unless it comes into contact with a living cell and then it starts extracting whatever you have inside that cell, the energy, uh, the elements, the enzymes, and then it replicates itself and makes many copies which spread and destroy the host cell and then uh, attack the other cells also. Now, these are concepts. If they are not clear to the person who was writing the script, then it's impossible for the director to communicate it to the people. So this is one of the most difficult thing 
And uh, if the topic is difficult, then obviously uh, this is a difficult topic to make. Even simple things like concept of electric field or magnetic field or electromagnetic field or idea of infinity, all these things are difficult things. So how do we deal them? This is very important that the script writer should know preferably in such cases, a little bit of science. However, there are some script writers who do a very good job after talking to the experts. They meet the experts, understand from them what it is, and then they write the script and they can write in, in a manner that a common man understands and appreciate that. Now, as I told you, when we make a film or when we do the popular science writing sometimes, or particularly science fiction, then we make an attempt to simplify things. In the beginning, in the month of March or so, uh, in the, uh, 2020, there was a time when leave aside the common man, even scientists did not understand what was SARS-CoV-2. They had heard of MERS, they had heard, heard of Ebola virus, they had heard of HIV and so on, but they did not know what it is. In fact, its initial name was different and later the WHO gave it a typical name, SARS-CoV-2. And, and the disease is known as COVID-19. Now, when people did not understand it, it was a challenge to explain it to people. So many people made some simplified pictures of the virus and that is the image which you see on the left. This is a sphere of a protein on which there are spikes or horns. They are also protein, they are made of S protein. But this is a very simplified picture. Actually, under a microscope lens, how the coronavirus would look like is what you see in the right thing. But you can rightly see that like a corona, there are spikes there. And this is uh, from one side at least, looks a bit of a, a spherical or circular part. So if it's not clear to the writer, it will be very difficult. So this can be considered a difficult theme because in normal life, nobody sees virus. Nobody even sees bacteria. So you are explaining to them something which is very small, which cannot be seen with naked eye, which cannot even be seen easily with the optical microscope. You have to resort to electron microscopes for that. Therefore, when the themes are difficult, it requires a lot of research and that requires a lot of time. The unfortunate uh, situation is that making a film can take six months. Writing of the script may take one week, uh, but for research, people don't want to spare. And I think that's not very fair. And I uh, always insist that we should allow adequate time to the researcher and to the script writer, because if the script is clear, uh, converting into converting it into a film becomes comparatively very easy. Because if the topic is difficult, more research on the subject is desired, uh, because specialization would be desired. Information, data should be taken from reliable sources. When a subject is new, it's not very easy to get information about that. But if you resort to net, to the unreliable sources, then the chances are that you will make a lot of mistakes. There are some very good uh, websites like NASA, ISRO, American Geological Survey, or US Geological Survey, World Health Organization, Indian Council for Medical Research, ICMR, India Meteorology Department, some of the good universities, particularly the central universities, and websites of uh, several national research institutions. There are very good sources of information. There are many more uh, government organizations which will give you a lot of information. And very often this information can be freely used when you are making a science film, science documentary, or a science program. For example, uh, I, I needed some material for one of the documentaries, so I wrote to NASA. Of course, I told them that I had been a scientific collabor collaborator with the NASA project of studying moon samples, but that was unimportant because they said, uh, you should acknowledge the source and you can use it for the non-commercial or educational purposes. So this is one thing I uh, want to tell you that when the topic is very difficult, please don't depend upon uh, newspaper reports, they may not be accurate. Go to the good websites. You can email to those organizations and they will provide you information. 
so that you can research and then you can write a script. Challenges can be some other types also, uh, like the physical conditions of the place where you are going to shoot uh, may not be very comfortable. Maybe uh, reaching that place is very difficult. Sometimes uh, there are field locations uh, which are at altitude. Uh, you cannot easily reach there without oxygen or the terrain is very tough. Uh, you cannot keep walking there. Sometimes you want to go to islands which are not connected by regular ferry services. You have to depend upon some uh, hired boats or motorboats and so on. And then you have to get a lot of information. For example, uh, we went to an island near in uh, near Gujarat coast. There were uh, coral islands, Mugeke Deep. Coral islands were there, and uh, uh, to go there we had to hire some motorboats. And again, because of this uh, problem of tides, the boat could reach there only at the time of high tide. So we had to reach there, and within a few hours we had to finish work and we had to come back. Then there can be other problems like uh, if this is a valley, then the light will be available for a very short time, particularly during winters. Sometimes it may be that the light is very intense because there is some source uh, nearby. Uh, if you want to do, uh, for example, uh, sky photography, and if there are uh, city lights nearby, you will not be able to do it. You have to go away uh, from the city and preferably near a lake or a river where the dust content in the atmosphere is very low. Sometimes you may have a problem that there are strong backlights and your object is dark. In such cases, uh, the contrast is uh, a problem and uh, you have to consider and adjust your cameras according to the foreground that is the object of your interest because background in that case would be virtually lost. Sometimes you observe uh, some phenomena uh, where there is a sudden uh, burst of light. For example, there can be lightning. Now there, the sky may be completely dark, but for a fraction of a second, you will see intense light. Now, how do you adjust camera to that? I remember in 1995, when they went for total solar eclipse live telecast, at that time, uh, the cameramen, they were trying a lot of X-ray films, darkened X-ray films uh, as a filter in front of the lenses of their camera so that when the sun is bright, they can photograph it and later they can gradually remove them when they are photographing sun which has been eclipsed. Sometimes there can be problems of noise. There could be a lot of background noise and uh, human ears are tuned. They have a capability of tuning to a particular uh, sound or a particular frequency, but the camera cannot do that. So camera captures all the sounds, whereas you want to record only a particular sound. So for that, you have to perhaps go several times, record that sound separately, and then later mix it with your uh, uh, visuals. So this is another kind of challenge, uh, another kind of difficulty. In some cases, uh, there could be chemical reaction. Uh, I would suggest that you watch on television, uh, Dancing Doctor. Uh, these are the videos which are available on YouTube. And that fellow conducts some beautiful chemistry experiments uh, for young students and people are really delighted and excited to watch them. Now, there you would see that when he does some experiments, sometimes there is a uh, light. Now, if your camera is- Sir, can you tell that name again? Okay, Dancing Doctor. Friends, write it down, Dancing Doctors. Thank you, sir. Sorry for the interruption. It's okay, thank you. for It's a help to the students. Uh, so uh, those are the uh, videos which you should watch and you would know how to make uh, such uh, videos which will be very enjoyable uh, for the students. But again, they will be, as I told you, there will be challenges because the lighting condition will change for a very short time. Sometimes there can be chemical reactions which uh, for a fraction of a second, uh, you may get shocked if you don't already know about that because there may be a sound. And at that time, your brain will stop working. So you must make some rehearsals and then go for the final kill. Similarly, sometimes there can be some very rapid movements. For example, something is still, and then because of a remote uh, field, like a magnetic field or electric field, something makes a sudden jerky movement. If you are not prepared for that, you might lose the focus. So you must know about the experiment in advance so that 
when you are going to shoot it, you are prepared for that and you can adjust because either you should be having tremendous uh, presence of mind, but uh, that doesn't always help and everyone may not have that kind of fun. Similarly, sometimes the, for a long time, there may be no movement, but when there is a very rapid movement, now that rapid movement may not be properly captured by your camera, which is working, let us say something like 24 frames per second. So if you know in advance that this movement is going to be very fast, then maybe you can use a camera which can work at higher frames per second. And therefore, afterwards, when you run that at a slow speed, you will be able to show the finer moments of, for example, uh, the moments of the feathers or wings of a bird, or moments of the legs of an insect, and so on. So in both these cases, prior preparation is required, mental preparation, as well as preparation with the gadgets. If you are going to a place, you should know well in advance what are the lighting conditions there. Would you require artificial lights? And if you require artificial lights, will you really have a source of electricity there? Because uh, when we went to some islands for Coral Island, and we wanted to some, do some experiment also, uh, we carried uh, some generators with us so that we could run those drilling machines there. So similarly, if you are carrying uh, lights with you, you must have a source so that you can charge them if it's required. Of course, these days you get LED lights. They don't consume uh, too, much of, uh, too much of electricity. Similarly, if the shooting is to be done inside a cave, this is sometimes possible. If you go to the Northeast and you are trying to photograph some caves of bats. So first thing is production would be very important. You have to first find out from people what kind of productive gear you should wear so that you are not attacked by the bats because sometimes they carry tremendous amount of terrible viruses. So you have to take care of your production. The caves may be dark. There may be a release or there may be seepage of gases or chemicals inside the caves. So all this information you should get in advance and you should not uh, risk your lives uh, for this purpose. But people do take risks and sometimes they're having problems. People have lost their cameras, for example, um, so Mike Pandey, if you might know, he lost one his camera when he was shooting some uh, lines in, uh, I think, Africa. So you have to take care of your gadget, you have to take care of your health, you have to take care of your lives. Now, sometimes the routine filming cannot bring out the phenomena very clearly. And there can be many reasons for that. For example, if this is a mass spectrometer, even if this is a glass made mass spectrometer, where you are able to see the components inside the body of the mass spectrometer most of the times, but you will not be able to see the movement of the electrons. You will not be able to see the movement of the ions, obviously, because these things are too small to be uh, seen with our naked eye. In fact, it's only in the last few years uh, that people have been able to photograph even molecule, atoms in uh, molecule. Earlier, even that was not possible. Uh, that is using a quantum effect. So if you don't see those things, then how can you make it clear to the people because you are trying to tell them that here we have, for example, an uh, electrode or a filament. The filament is emitting electrons. These electrons are ionizing the atoms or the molecules. Then we are applying a magnetic field and making them move in a particular direction. But none of these things will be visible on the screen. So you have to take help of graphics. You have to take help from animation. And then you have to make it clear to the people what is really happening. So this is something to be done afterwards uh, at the editing table or in the uh, post-production stage. Sometimes you show the growth of a plant or flowering. So as you may have seen in many documentaries, that requires a lot of efforts, uh, very long wait, uh, the cameras are left switched on, they photograph them and finally you run them fast and within a few seconds you see the uh, blooming of the flower and so on. But actual activity was uh, for a very long time, you squeeze it into a short time or sometimes the actual activity in the previous example which I had given, the activity is for a very short time and you slow it down so that your viewers can see and understand it properly. So graphics, animation, 
and sometimes voice over to supplement the visual because visual will not really tell you so much. Sometimes uh, there is a process which becomes boring. For example, if you are showing somebody uh, working on, uh, on, uh, uh, on some board, some electronics uh, experiment or something where the person is soldering small components onto a board, PCB for example, uh, printed circuit board. Now, if you show that person soldering each component in the board, it may take several hours. And obviously uh, every second is precious on a TV or a film screen. Then how do you do it? This process of two hours can be squeezed into a few seconds. You show that person switching on the soldering iron or picking up a connected soldering iron, then joining one end of a component, then show him at the next stage, which was after one hour or half an hour, where he has joined almost half the component. And then you come to the end and you show. There will be discontinuity, there will be visual jerks here, uh, but to avoid them, you can show them the expression of some other person who is standing close by. Because here their challenges are true. You have to squeeze, squeeze two hours process to maybe five seconds. You also want to make sure that there are no visual jerks. Like uh, if he shows, uh, if he connects one component and then we cut it, then he's halfway and then he has completed the job. There will be visual jerks. So what you do is you show him connecting one component, then camera turns towards another person who is looking at it. And then you show him again that he is halfway and so on. So you can show the whole process within a few seconds. If you feel that still it hasn't become very clear, you can keep a clock in the background or you can show his wristwatch in a way that the viewer understand that the whole process has really taken long time and he doesn't get an impression that it has been uh, happening over a few seconds. So show the beginning, you show the mid part and you show the end of the process and using a clock or a watch, uh, you give an idea how much time it has taken. So that way people will understand how much time it's taken. Sometimes you face another problem, which we faced recently, a uh, film was being made on uh, Indonesian Science Academy by some company in Bombay for Vigyan Pasa, and I was involved in that. We wanted to uh, get an interview of one very, very important person, Bharatatna Prasasiyanada. But given the conditions in Bangalore, it seemed difficult. The moment they are restricted, people won't allow uh, a TV crew to come to their place. Of course, some people did. Uh, but everybody was not uh, happy with that. Uh, some people allowed and uh, shooting was done. But where it was not possible, and it was not possible in case of one of the most important persons. So what we did was we used, uh, first we tried with an old clipping, uh, but that was not a very good quality. So we took different steps of that uh, scientist uh, from different sources because he had been a visitor to International Science Academy and many institutions. We took those photographs, we took one of the quotes, and since the voiceover from the original person was not available, I gave the voiceover, and that was, uh, that was voiceover with the visuals, still visuals, still photographs of that person, a three or four photographs. And so we made it for a few seconds, by zooming, we made it a little bit interesting. And now it uh, looks quite natural. So sometimes you will not be able to get the expert because you have to make do uh, with efforts like that. That is using the pictures, using the audio or the voiceover. But one important thing is when you are using a still photographs in a film, of course, people, many people believe that this is sacrilege. It should not be done. But that is not really the case. Uh, you can make it dynamic. Don't keep it static. Zoom the camera, tilt the camera, pan the camera, and you can this way get a few seconds to give the voiceover and your uh, screen will not look like a dead screen. Sometimes there is one uh, very serious problem and uh, I have faced it during uh, uh, TV interviews uh, where I was uh, moderating it. And uh, I'm sure that many of you who have interviewed uh, scientists particularly uh, for your documentaries or some of the programs, you must have experienced it too. Sometimes the experts speak so little. I'll give you an example. You ask somebody, 
this uh, COVID-19 is because of a virus. And the expert says, yes. And then he stopped speaking. Now, this is a very, very uh, tricky situation. Uh, did you try another, another one? Is virus uh, very different from bacteria? And the person says, yes. Now, you don't know what to do. Sometimes there are experts who are experienced, who are seasoned. If you ask them what uh, is uh, uh, COVID-19 because of a virus, they will say, yes, this is uh, because of a virus and not because of a bacteria. Because bacteria and virus are very different. Bacteria is a living entity. Virus is not a living entity. And maybe in answer to this short question, the expert can go on speaking for a minute or two and audience get a lot of information. So this is important to meet your expert in advance, talk to that expert and try to gauge uh, what kind of person that uh, expert is. That is, if that person is very good at speaking, is a good conversationalist, uh, then there is no problem. But if the person is uh, one word answer type, then you have to talk to that person well in advance and sound him, help him. Sometimes even perhaps you will have to keep him some kind of uh, prompters. You can keep daily prompters if it's possible. If that is not possible, uh, you try to get something typed in big letters on a big sheet or handwrite cleanly on a big sheet and hang it uh, from the camera so that person gets uh, a few uh, tips. But at the same time, in some cases, it will be very important to do rehearsals. If you do the rehearsals, then the person will get experience, but don't overdo it because if you overdo it, then the chances are, it will look like you know uh, a very, very boring program. You, you uh, speak out a question and the person starts muttering the answer and it becomes very boring. So don't ever give the exact question to the expert in advance. You roughly give them that this is a point we'll be talking about. That way, uh, that person will be speaking naturally and your program will look natural. In other words, you don't have to be spontaneous, but you must appear to be spontaneous. If you keep this in mind, your interviews for your documentaries will be lively and a lot of information will be conveyed to the people. If you feel that the uh, speaker or the expert is a nervous type, then start talking to him before the camera starts rolling. Talk to him about his hobbies. Talk to him about uh, something else. Maybe he, has, uh, he likes cricket. Maybe he likes uh, music or something. Put him at comfort. And then you start uh, talking to him about the subject and start recording. So still, you may end up, because you have not done your research or because the time was short, you end up with an expert who is not fluent. He, when you ask a simple question, he says, uh, I mean, uh, I, you see last time, uh, uh, no, 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 when I actually, when, when I was going, no, 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 I was when coming from the lab, this happened. Now, this is not how you are going to put it in your interviews. So one good idea will be to edit out even the vocal part, even the, uh, what he's speaking, and also insert the visuals in between. For example, if he's saying laboratory, maybe if you uh, insert a photograph of his laboratory, uh, then uh, he will not be visible on the screen and it will look a little better. Similarly, sometimes there can be uh, gestures, sometimes there can be embarrassing uh, expressions, sometimes there could be uh, some un undesired uh, movement of the body and so on. So that increases your work at the editing table. Uh, but if you have time, then please meet the expert, talk to him in advance or her in advance and try to uh, fix your strategy beforehand. Sometimes you don't get the experts. Sometimes, of course, some may be pretending that they're very busy, but sometimes uh, they can be really busy. And there are some who are unwilling because they don't want to be misinterpreted. So whenever you are talking for a documentary to an expert, one of the most important thing is you should generate enough, enough confidence in them so that they believe that you will not be misquoting them. Some journalists don't like it, but I always believe that if you take certain part of their statement, 
this is a good idea to show them of course if the person is very finicky he can go on raising objections but most of the time they are not but make sure that there is no miss interpretation because you have edited the statement uh, in the editing uh, at the editing table because sometimes that can spoil your relations with the person uh, for life sometimes people are hesitant because they want permission from the government permission from their boss permission from uh, some other authority so that is a genuine constraint because there are many topics about which scientists are not supposed to talk to the press for example uh, monsoon because this has if you announce or say anything about the monsoon this has other implications on economy on agriculture on markets and so on so there are certain things which are restricted so please don't force them and if they ever tell you anything in confidence don't reveal it to anybody at any cost if you don't want to lose your reputation of being a reliable person some scientists may have uh, language issues so you have to do perhaps a little a uh, few of the rehearsal and sometimes if by mistake they have told about some confidential matter which they were not supposed to tell and they request you to remove it then i think as a gentle person gentleman or a lady uh, it's your duty to abide by his request even if it costs you a little bit of time and effort uh, you can always uh, use uh, proper cuts like uh, sometimes you can use straight cuts sometimes you can put match cut which means uh, in, in some film it's shown that you throw something it goes towards space and after some time it changes into a satellite so there the two different things have been matched very well sometimes uh, you put straight cuts on one person's face and another person's face again on one person's face again back to the other person straight cuts but sometimes you use some other kind of cuts you can use cross cuts when there is a conversation going on and so on uh, but this is not the topic of my uh, but what i am trying to tell you that in a difficult theme many of these tricks can come handy whenever you are making a documentary i used to think about the topic the target viewership the language the purpose technical and the logistic limitation and proper research is very important sometimes you cannot go to the place where the action is you may not be able to go to shri harikota where the launch is happening or the cape canaveral uh, where the launch is happening you have to depend sometimes on the clipping if you are making a documentary on that so you can always request photographs or clips from them which they will uh, usually provide if you can convince them that you are doing it for a reasonable purpose you may even get some of these things from their website but this is always a gentlemanly behavior to quote the source sometimes it's good to ask for permission always acknowledge the source uh, if images are not available you can use the diagrams sometimes they can be helpful if they are attractive in fact images can sometimes confuse because there are too many details whereas line diagrams with colors can sometimes convey the things uh, much more clearly if you are taking something from the website not only keep the link or the address of the website also note down the date you should know the date uh, on which you have a, a time when you have taken it uh, for your record sometimes uh, you want to document uh, one event uh, whose timing can get delayed for example if this is launch even if the uh, back count has started and it's only one hour for that as it hap as had happened in the uh, uh, case of india also uh, the time can change you should have enough in your kitty enough anecdotes enough stories even by uh, enough biographies uh, maybe even some people available nearby to whom you have already talked that you get in conversation with them so that if there is a delay in the actual event the screen is not blank and you are not found uh, you know begging for something useful to present on the screen so be ready with the backup you can even keep uh, videos and stories and uh, cartoons and pictures and uh, experts available uh, whom you can approach at that time sometimes you have to deal with animals it may be in the wild or it may be in the laboratory so please be aware that there are rules for the ethical treatments of animals 
uh, there are, uh, if you go to any government site, uh, the appropriate government site, you will find them. Uh, and very often you find a statement at the end uh, of the film that all the animals were treated ethically. In the laboratory, if the animals are being treated, there is also code of ethics or a set of ethics for them. And uh, if you want to know what they are, on the website of Indian National Science Academy, uh, you can find a free book on uh, ethics uh, about animals, animal uh, in the laboratory. But when you are in the wild, the animals can be unpredictable. So you have to be prepared for that. They may behave differently than what you may have expected based on your experience in the zoo. Sometimes you may have to wait for hours together to catch a clip. I, I have not, never done wildlife photography except as a hobby uh, for my own, but I have heard some lectures for people like uh, Mike Pandey. But if you have seen the documentaries by Mr. Unni Krishnan, uh, you would know that sometimes for a few seconds clip, they have to spend months. If you see the, uh, uh, the National Geographic or uh, uh, these uh, uh, documentaries, you will know what I am talking about. Uh, day before we had uh, on in this uh, forum only, an interview of Mr. Abhishek, and uh, he has been working with many of these sites. So if you ever get to talk to these people, you would know that you have to wait for hours or days or sometimes even months to get a clipping for a few seconds or a few minutes. Sounds are not always recordable. Sometimes they can be very bleak sounds. In fact, people leave their microphones in the wild and move away from there, and uh, later they come and collect it, and sometimes they lose it also. So these are things uh, because people make uh, uh, wildlife uh, films. Uh, they also are treated as uh, films on environment and therefore science documentary. One of the most serious problem which people face is availability of authentic material for the documentary script. Uh, we have discussed it uh, in the very beginning of the lecture also. Uh, one can access net, one can Google uh, some information, uh, but unless this is from a good authentic source, please don't use that. Because these days, there are a lot of fake sites. There is a lot of fake information, just like in a rural mela, in a rural fair, uh, chart is, if it's available free, maybe uh, diarrhea is also available free. Similarly, information, misinformation, disinformation, they are rampant on net. So be, be careful from where you pick your information. Rely on good websites. I have already told you about them, uh, like uh, US Geological Survey or ICMR or WHO or ISRO or US, uh, 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 NASA and so on. For information, you should depend on good journals. There are many popular magazines also, but not all popular magazines will give you authentic information. You should go to the in fact, if uh, many of you, if you want, you can get the some important articles, particularly about Corona, from even journals like Science and Nature Free these days. They have made it free. Even Scientific American, one of the best or perhaps the best uh, popular science magazine in the world. If you write to them, go to their website, request them, they will start sending you uh, their articles related to Corona Free. To go to the websites of Nature, Science, science academies, for example, Indian National Science Academy, uh, Indian Academy of Sciences, or National Academy of Sciences, or US Academy of Sciences, and so on, they will have very good information available on the net. You go to the good publishers like Springer, Francis and Miller, Macmillan, or Sage, they publish very good research journals. There are many others like our Indian Academy of Sciences or uh, uh, Indian National Science Academy. They also publish journals. They are authentic, sources of information. However, this is not very easy to understand those research papers, but these journals also carry uh, some journal articles there where things are presented in a very simplified manner. You should go to popular science magazine like Scientific American, New Scientist, New Scientist is a British magazine, a Scientific American is published from uh, mainly from USA. La Research is a French magazine, Science Reporter from CSIR and their associated magazines. Uh, then Vigyan Prasar publishes uh, uh, one very good magazine, uh, Dream 2047. Uh, then there are many other magazines uh, published from private uh, uh, groups. Uh, you can go to them. 
but please verify the information available from non-governmental sources because that may or may not be authentic. Then there are a lot of claims by pharmaceutical firms, by food manufacturers, which you would read every day in your newspapers. They are not always true. They are basically uh, published, they are sponsored research, they give you what the sponsor wants. They will tell you a particular oil is free from cholesterol. Uh, oil will be free from cholesterol because this is from vegetable source and so on. So please uh, be very careful about from where you get your information. And one very big challenge, which even I'm facing now today, because I don't know whom I am talking to. Uh, if I am talking to somebody like uh, Unnan Krishnan Sahab or Nandan Kutiyadi ji or Seema Murli Dhara ji or Abhishek ji or uh, some such person, uh, then I'm in trouble because they, they already know all these things. They have been making films for so many years. Uh, but uh, if I'm talking to people who are students of uh, science filmmaking or who are from other professions who want to learn, so this is a risk always involved. So as far as possible, try to find out who your viewers will be. Because if you're clear about that, you will be able to set a standard or tone or level for your uh, science uh, program or science documentary. Because if it's young students, then the subject will also be different. If these are housewives, the topic will be different. If these are teachers or uh, faculty of universities, the level will be different. If these are educated people who are expert in their own fields, but not about the subject on which you are making documentary, then the level has to be different. But one, good, one thing is very clear, uh, to be on the safe side, explain things as much as possible. Use visuals, liberally. Use charts, bar charts, but explain them well because a common man doesn't understand what the X and Y axis mean. There should be no formulae, no technical jargon, unless it's impossible to do without them. The choice of topic is also very important. People will uh, glue to your program if this is about something topical. For example, uh, recently we had some program about uh, COVID-19 and uh, the viewership was very high. So at this time, if we talk about earthquake, perhaps not many people would listen, but if this is about how to protect yourself from the COVID-19, then a lot of people will flock to watch your program. And always ask uh, your producer, if you are writing, always ask a producer for whom the film or the documentary is being made. And always remember, one shoe doesn't fit all. What I mean is, the same program cannot cater to everybody because the level of understanding, level of knowledge, even level of language would be different for different groups of people. When it comes to higher sciences, some concepts require some kind of some minimum background. Either you provide it in your uh, program or you expect that the audience already knows it, which is possible only if those people belong to that particular feed. So you must clearly know for whom you are making the program. You can sacrifice the details, but without distorting. Every video program or every documentary uh, may not be for everybody. Sometimes there are general documentaries, which anybody would understand. But sometimes you make for niche audience. So you should know about that. And you should accordingly, because if you don't have to give introduction, you will be saving a lot of time which you can use for transmitting some other information. So uh, very, be very clear about whom you are making this film. So usually in India, the tradition has been that uh, most of the time we have been making uh, science documentaries for children. If you look at, uh, at the sites of uh, government agencies also, most of the time the films are for young because they are the people where it's felt they are in the most impressionable age. But now is time that we also care for the people who are in their 30s, their 40s, or 50s. We should make a film based on physics also for somebody who is a PhD in biology, some aspect of biology. We should also make a film on geological subject for a person who has done a PhD in physics or mathematics. So there could be films made for niche audience, 
and each film has to be dealt with separately, spatially, and the script has to be written very carefully. We should also ta target, for example, uh, films on medical themes by talking to doctors and researchers in the medical sciences, but this film will be targeted at housewives. Maybe these films will be targeted at a man who wants to know how he can keep himself healthy. We can talk to the expert and try to bring out science which is useful in an average man's life. I don't know, but I want to know if I open a bottle of mineral water or uh, clean water which is being sold in a bottle form these days, once I open the bottle for how many days water is safe? I want to know it, uh, but there may not be any very clear answer published anywhere. So these are some very simple questions. Or how does one avoid contracting coronavirus? Some very simple precautions people can tell. How do you use mask? You must have seen short films on television. How, how do you use a mask carefully, safely, and uh, so that you get the best protection? You can buy the most expensive mask, but if you don't wear it properly, this is useless. So we should be making films for the experts. We should be making films for those who hardly know any science. We should make films for those who are curious, who want to know why the sky was red last evening, who want to know why the sun is behind the haze, those who want to know why there is so much of fog, people who want to know when it was warm, all of a sudden, why did it start raining or it became cold? All <clears throat> they want to know that there was so much of fog here, but why this is feeling warm now? So these are the documentaries, small films, which can be made. But you will find some uh, difficulties when you are doing it for uh, uh, science themes. Uh, one example, if you show a very huge instrument, there is a very big equipment which has a lot of wires, a lot of cable connections, a lot of walls, a lot of components, a lot of uh, capacitors, a lot of, lot of these things. And you show the whole equipment and there is no way you can zoom in on and that particular thing because this is either far away or there is some limitation, technical limitation with your camera. And how do you do that? You have to find a way, for example, you can use in, as in, after the, in the post-production, you can use arrows, you can make circles to show that particular part on which your focus is. Sometimes you can arrange the lighting so that only that part which you want to show as important is being illuminated properly where the light on other part is dim so that the viewer immediately knows that this is the part which is important. Sometimes you can compose such that, for example, uh, <clears throat> if you have uh, some archeological objects uh, in a museum, they may not allow you to adjust them. If this is something else, you may arrange them in a composition so that the object of interest is most prominent. But if you're not allowed to touch them, then you have to use lighting. You can light, you can illuminate them in such a manner that that particular object of interest comes out uh, sharply. Sometimes you can use other tricks. For that, you have to understand some basics of camera, for example. Uh, but I think uh, most of you who are uh, watching this program know about that, that there is something called F number on the camera, on the lens of the rim of the lens of the camera, you will find F and A. These days, many people use the automatic uh, choice. Uh, so that by programming, the camera selects it. Uh, but still, there is a reason why we must understand the meaning. If you look at the F number, they will be like 1.2, 1.7, or 1.8, or 1.4, 2, 2.4, 2.8, 3.2, 4, 5.6, 8, 11, 16, 22, and so on. So when the F number is increasing, the opening for the lens or the aperture, it's decreasing. They go reciprocally. Similarly, when you see the shutter speed, when you see, 20, uh, let us say 100 written there, what it means is one by 100 seconds. The aperture will be open for one by 100 seconds, which means if your source is very bright, you have to give a short exposure and you have to give a large F number or a small aperture. You can play between these two because when the, when the uh, F number 
is small, which means when the aperture is large, the depth of focus will be small. If you have a lot of things one behind the other, so you only focus on one particular object. And if you are using an F number like uh, 1.4, 1.7, 1.8, or 2, you will see that uh, most of the things behind that object are out of focus, they are blurred. Similarly, you must have, must have seen while watching the cricket commentary that they are using a telephoto lens. So many of the things in the background, uh, they, they appear to be very close, they appear to be closer than what they really are. So these are the things uh, which one uh, must keep in mind. Another important thing, I think my time, I have just 10 more minutes. So uh, when we write a script, our general policy is to explain the unknown in terms Is there of... no problem, you take your time. We can okay, go 15 okay. more minutes because we started late. Okay, okay, you fine. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so this part, which uh, I am uh, dealing with now, uh, this relates to uh, the uh, scripting part or the writing part or the explaining part. When we look at uh, anything, we try to understand it in terms of our familiar objects, familiar experiences, which may be uh, familiar sounds, which may be familiar uh, pictures, which may be in familiar objects. Now, there is a play here. When we try to explain, when a scientist tries to explain a new phenomenon or a new object to people, what does he do? He says, this looks like this. For example, when atom was explained to people, they said it's like a, a tarboos. It's like a watermelon where uh, there, is a, there, is a, uh, there is an atom and in between you have uh, 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 a nucleus and there are neutrons or protons inside that. So that, but actually uh, we very well know uh, that there are a lot of dissimilarities between a, uh, between a watermelon and an atom. Watermelon is huge, about uh, 25 centimeters in size, whereas the atom is very small or molecule is very small. And those particles are much, much smaller than the seeds inside the, uh, uh, inside the fruit, inside the watermelon. So sometimes whenever we are giving a simile, we ought to be very careful in respect of which attribute are we talking. If you say something looks like a football. Now, when I'm saying that, I, I believe that people will think that I'm talking about something which is round like a football, but it's not always uh, necessary. Maybe that person is thinking, oh, it's like a football. That means this is white and black in color. There may be another person who thinks that, oh, that means this is filled with compressed air. There may be a third person who thinks that this is bouncy. If we bounce it on the ground, it comes back. There may be another person who thinks that, okay, this is some object which is made by stitching small pieces of leather or, or some, uh, uh, some synthetic material together. There may be another person who thinks that, oh, this is something which is used as a play material. So when we give simile, we must specify in what respect the similarity is suggested. Unless we do that, uh, there is a possibility that the uh, viewer or the reader or the listener would be confused. So we should be very clear about that. Uh, I remember an incident from my uh, graduate days uh, when a teacher was telling us about uh, fusion. You, you know about nuclear fission and fusion. Uh, we have nuclear reactors in India also where energy is being produced by nuclear fission. But now people are talking about nuclear fusion where uh, atoms or isotopes of hydrogen, they are fused together and in the process, energy would be released. This has not been possible to do it uh, uh, beyond a very short time, like second or a fraction of a second. But now there are commercial firms who are engaging in that. There is a group in India who is also trying to invest money in that. But anyway, apart from that, what I'm trying to tell you is the teacher was trying to explain that inside a nuclear fusion reactor, the gas is in the form of a torus. Now the torus is what you see here. So the American books say that the torus is like a donut, which you see here, this pink object colored thing. I have deliberately used colors so that I can distinguish. The blue thing is a torus. Please ignore the lines. This is a torus and the plasma or the heated gas 
that is confined using magnetic fields within that region, which is blue. And the shape American textbooks say is like uh, a donut, which you eat, which you get from the bakery. But an Indian in a village or many Indians won't understand what a donut is. So when we explain torus to them, maybe we could say this is something like a bada, which is uh, empty in the center, which has a kind of circular cross section, which is round in shape. It is like a medu bada. So this will appeal to an Indian more, uh, most of the Indians more than saying that a torus is like a uh, uh, donut. So what I'm trying to tell is that the similarities should be suggested, but we should be careful that we give the right example. We also mm -hmm. tell that this is with respect to shape. For example, a torus is not tasting like a, a donut, but its, its shape is like a donut, or it's not uh, tasting like a medu vada. Uh, its shape resembles this. So these are some other things which in science communication we must keep in mind. Now, uh, whenever we are using uh, regional languages, it Hindi or Bangla or Tamil or Marathi or any other language, uh, we should be using the scientific or technical term which have been approved by the uh, CSTT, which is Commission for Scientific and Technical Terminology, uh, so that there is a uniformity. If you think that this term is still more difficult than the original English term, or if you think that this term will not be understandable because it's not popular, you also use the English term with that, but explain the meaning. But you should also be very careful that understanding the subject is very important when you're writing a script. But most of the script writers do not believe, belong to the subject on which they're writing a script. So you should be in touch with uh, some good person uh, in that field and make sure that you are not misinterpreting. I'll give you some very simple examples. When we say cell, we would mean cell for a torch, but then cell can mean different things to different people. This may be a cell in a jail, like cellular jail uh, in Andaman Nicobar. In biology, this is something which we have in our body, the cell in our body, which are attacked by the, for example, uh, coronavirus. But in a, for battery, uh, the cell means uh, a source of electricity. So going to the dictionary, is not enough, you must use the correct word in the right context. Then sometimes we write very long sentences and these long sentences can sometimes get you in trouble. I'll give you an example. And these are examples from the uh, BBC. So uh, they are genuine. After struggling for an hour, the veterinary doctor and the animal were face to face. Please read and hear this sentence again. After struggling for an hour, the veterinary doctor and the animal were face to face. It doesn't become clear who was struggling. Was the doctor struggling or was it the animal who was struggling? Because this is a case of a dangling modifier. They should have very clear that after the doctor struggled for an hour, he was face to face with the animal. Or doctor was face to face with the animal after animal had struggled for an hour. So it should be clear. Similarly, another example. After orbiting the moon for several days, the scientists decided to drop the probe on the moon's surface. So who was actually orbiting? Was it the scientists who were orbiting or was it the space probe which was orbiting the moon? The sentence doesn't make it clear. So we should be very careful in framing the sentence it, and we should not leave it to the guesswork of the uh, person who is watching or listen to the book. Because in science, we should not leave it only to the common sense. We should be very clear because in science, there are unexpected things. There are unexpected results. And it does not always is, does not always go in agreement with the common sense. So often uh, we ask a question to an expert and the question is not clear. And this particularly happens in the case of uh, uh, political issues but it also happens in the case of science. Now look at this sentence. If I ask, do you generate liquid hydrogen for your use? Question mark. If yes, comma, how and where do you use it? Now you see, 
in the, this form, I'm asking, do you generate liquid nitrogen for your juice? The second question is, if yes, how? And how and where do you store it? So I have asked two things, whether you generate liquid nitrogen, then how and where do you store it? I'm asking about the generation, if you do it, and I'm asking, where do you store it and how do you store it? I am not asking, how do you generate it? But if I put a comma, then you see, look at the sentence. Do you generate liquid nitrogen, liquid nitrogen for your use? If yes, how? Comma. So I have already asked two questions. Do you generate liquid nitrogen for your use? If yes, then how do you generate it? And then the third question comes, and where do you store it? So just by not pronouncing uh, properly, not pausing after the comma, or by forgetting to insert the comma there, I can change the meaning of the sentences. It can become two questions instead of three questions. So we have to be very careful about syntax also. Then uh, I, I'll, I'll, I'll now tell you a small uh, joke. Uh, you must have heard a lot of stories about Santa and Banta. Uh, they can be anything. They can be Santa Prasad and Banta Prasad. This example will tell you why clear expression is very important. This can sometimes be fatal not to use it correctly. The story goes like this. Panta is the best blacksmith in the town. Panta gaon ka sabse achha luhar hai. But then he was approached by Santa. And Santa said, sir, why don't you take me as your apprentice? Panta said, why not? You come and join me today itself. So he said, now I am going to heat an iron rod and I will be working on that. So Banta says to Santa, when I nod my head, you strike with the hammer. And now you remember, Banta was the best blackest within the town, but he made a mistake. He said, strike with the hammer when I nod. So he nodded his head and Santa struck on his head with the hammer. And now Santa is the best blackest myth of the town because Santa is dead. A little carelessness costed Santa his life. So that it's important that the instructions are written and given and spoken very clearly, especially in the technical manuals, where there could be high voltages and it could cost somebody life if the instruction is not very clearly written and there is a confusion. In your uh, film, you should uh, curb your habit of giving too much data. People are allergic to data. Don't give them too much data. Don't fill the screen with the data unless maybe for a second or fraction of a second, you can show uh, the data sheets to impress upon people that so much of data has been collected. But people don't want to read that data. People don't want to know numbers to the 10th place of decimal. If you say value of pi, or still better, you say the ratio of circumference of a circle to its radius is 3.14 or still better, a little more than three. If you tell somebody that we take 2.125 milliliter of this chemical and mix it with the 8.59685 milliliter of this chemical, we get this result. They're not going to do that experiment. So it's not important for them. You can simply tell them that we take one spoonful of this and one and a half times of that or twice of that and we mix them and this is what happens. So Accuracy and precision are important when the viewer is interested, but otherwise don't give unwanted details. Similarly, if you are going to explain to them the structure of uh, coronavirus uh, or uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus, you don't have to really tell them the molecular structure unless it's a community of scientists. But it's important to tell people about the structure of a coronavirus, because you are going to tell them that when you wash your hands with soap, you dissolve the oily web on the body of the coronavirus. Because you know that coronavirus is a protein shell on which there are spikes, and there is also web or some kind of a jali, some material which is uh, oily which is fatty. And just like you remove uh, mail from your clothes, 
or the dirt from your clothes using detergent, you use your detergent to remove this web from the corona after which it cannot attach to your cells. There it becomes important to convince people that they should really wash their hands maybe for 40 seconds uh, with detergent if they want to make that corona ineffective. So when the purpose is clear, then other things follow very easy. Statistics can be confusing. If somebody says that in their experiment, 66% of the mice or two-thirds two of the mice showed positive reaction to the medicine, you must ask them how many mice were used in the experiment. Maybe you would come to know that the experiment was done only on three mice. So if you do the experiment on just three mice, uh, your results cannot be taken to be very serious. Similarly, if somebody tells you the crop yield went up to 200%, Make sure that you make it clear to the audience that it means the crop has not become 100 plus 200, 300% or three times. Crop has increased by 100%. That means crop has doubled or it has increased by 100% or it has increased to 200%. Similarly, if somebody tells you that in a department, the girls, 100% of the girls married 20% of the faculty member. There is nothing to be shocked about it because you would very soon realize there were just two girls in the department and there were 10 male members. Two of the girls married two of the male members. So it became 100% of the girls who married 20% of the faculty members who were male. So about numbers, newspapers and media, they very often fumble. So you have to be very careful about that. And uh, uh, again, when you are talking about a science script, you say that we mix or we take these two chemicals in equal amount. Now you should be very clear, what do you mean by equal amount? Do you mean one liter of this strength and one liter of this strength? Or you mean one gram mole and one gram mole? Or do you mean 100 atoms of sodium and 100 atoms of chlorine? I'll give you this with an example. If you go to a restaurant and the restaurant fellow shows, uh, told you, tells you that uh, we have a special dish. This is a pumpkin and grapes. And when you eat it, you find there is no taste of grape. And when you ask him, uh, did you mix any grapes? He said, sir, we always use it one is to one ratio. And it's only afterwards you realize what he meant by one is to one ratio was not that one kilogram of pumpkin and one kilogram of grape. What he meant is one pumpkin and one grape. So similarly, in science also, when you say they are equal, then you should be very clear where the number of atoms is equal or number of uh, gram molecules is equal or what it is. So in science, some small things uh, can become sometimes very important. Terminology is another issue, but uh, it's quite dicey. Uh, those who are not working in the field sometimes can get very confused. When an astronomer says metal, he may be meaning hydrogen, which is a gas. Whereas a chemist normally uh, would mean metal when he means something like iron or nickel or cobalt or uh, copper or aluminum or some such thing. Similarly, plasma to a physicist means the fourth state of matter, which is Heated gas. If you gas, if you heat the gas to a very high temperature, uh, it will be quasi-neutral mixture of uh, ions, and that state is known as plasma. For example, our sun or the stars. But to a biologist, a plasma means something completely different. So when you have to translate the script, be careful that you use the term in the proper context. Similarly, nucleus, uh, the cell uh, of a body, or it's its nucleus of an atom. Similarly, satellite DNA has nothing to do with the satellites which are orbiting in the space. So a term in science and technology has a specific meaning and you should take care of that. Uh, almost uh, at the end, another thing is dimensions. If you want your uh, viewers to realize, because you see, even the smallest item can fill the whole screen space. And the viewer has no way of knowing 
how big this object really is. Either you put a scale there, which not many people uh, uh, will be able to understand. So you must also tell them about the size. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, if you say that uh, this uh, pollen grain, which you see at the top, two wing-like things, this is a pollen grain. Uh, if you say this is very big, then you will be meaning this is one tenth of a millimeter. This is a part of uh, <laughs> plants of, uh, for example, in the flower, you find this pollen grains. And if this is very big, then this may be 100 microns or one tenth of a millimeter. But if you say the very small galaxy, then the, even the smallest galaxy may be 300 light years in size, which means it's so huge that if light starts moving from one end, it will take 300 years for it to uh, go to the other end. So in summary, uh, I would like to tell you that it's very important in, to understand the subject and identifying the right researcher and uh, therefore writers are very important. One may even choose one person for interfacing if you are not from that subject. In introducing concepts which are new, very careful choice of words and phrases is needed. Uh, this you must allow, if you are a director, you must allow enough time for research. Don't compromise on that. Decide the target viewership right at the beginning and keep the level accordingly. Depend on the reliable source for information. Don't uh, go just to any website and uh, take down the information. Take the viewers from known to the unknown, and which is a universal principle for teaching. That is explain the unknown subject in terms of known concepts and idea. In India, science documentaries are being made usually by small teams. So very often the director and the script writer, and sometimes even the cameraman is the same person. Uh, but sometimes when it's not, uh, you should uh, maximize the utility of each component and uh, good understanding of all aspects by director is very important, uh, and that includes uh, the photograph. So thank you very much for a very patient listening. I would be happy to answer questions. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, now we are ready for the questions. So if you have any question, kindly write it down in the chat box. Uh, sir, uh, but... Uh, before uh, we go uh, to the question, I have a question. Like uh, one thing which I am seeing that most of the science communications are in English language. Most of the talks are there in English language. So what about uh, the people who are not very versed with English? Uh, because uh, uh, according to our constitution, the scientific temple should be developed in, in the entire country for all, everyone. So what is the current scenario of regional language science communication? What is the regional language science communication scenario in India, sir? Uh, for example, if you look at your magazine, Dream 2047, uh, mm -hmm. it's being published in Hindi and English form. If you look at uh, Science Reporter, it's a popular science magazine. This is mm -hmm. also being published in Hindi and Urdu. Uh, if you uh, look, there are many science magazines like... Uh, 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 electronic from Bhopal, this is in Hindi. Uh, then there is uh, uh, Vaganik from Mumbai, this is in Hindi. Uh, then you have Avishkar, uh, which is in Hindi. In English, you have Invention and Intelligence. You also have uh, uh, Tell Me Why being published from uh, Kerala from Kottayam. Uh, then even in the Mar Marathi language, in, in Tamil language, in other language, and now uh, Vigyan Prasad has started, uh, at a, I am not the authority to talk about that, uh, but as I learned from Dr. Parash, the director, uh, in many Indian languages, including Bengali, in Kannad, in uh, uh, I think Telugu also, in Bangla, uh, in many of these languages now publications are being brought up. So I think uh, if you want to reach out to people, and if you want that people should develop scientific temples, then this is very important that we publish things in Indian languages, because still, English is language of very few people in uh, India. In scientific community, because of international nature of research, uh, people uh, talk and write in English language. Uh, but at least I personally make sure that uh, I have given something like 800, 900 lectures. And I would say that 70% uh, or more lectures I have given in uh, either Hindi or in some other language. And uh, I, I 
urge all the scientists to do the same. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much, sir. Uh, yes, मुझे याद है जब मैं छोटा था तो मेरा बचपन विज्ञान प्रगति पढ़ते हुए ही बड़ा हुआ था. So certainly, and anyone who wants to have uh, the Hindi or any other original language magazines and science please uh, write to vigyan prasar and sir's organization and probably we will be very happy to guide you and probably there are so many books uh, on on uh, your web uh, organization's website sir that is free to download and free to read am i am i right yes uh, there are many books which i think are available even on uh, vigyan prasar website uh, in in english language there are a lot of very important documents and books available on the website of indian national science academy which is insa india dot r e s dot in insa that is i n s a i n s a i n d i a insa india dot r e s dot in if you go to this website you will find some very good books on some very important uh, issues like uh, uh, ethical treatment of elements ethics in publications and research you will also find a book on uh, genetic engineering and uh, many other reports and uh, there is a wonderful book uh, which you can download uh, free from in, in uh, website is uh, indian science transforming india this book has been published in hindi and english both you can download it from there free and you can buy if you want from it okay sir uh, one question is from shanta chaudhary i don't know how much it's relevant here a uh, specific difference between a script and a screenplay okay uh, the script is a comparatively earlier stage of uh, this where a screenplay is as you can say short to short description of the whole thing you break it into shots or uh, how you are going to show it on the screen in case of a script this is a plan of things but in case of a screenplay this is how this is going to appear on the screen and uh, there was one more question in the beginning that uh, how do we show the graphs and all which are published in the research journal uh, yes uh, you are right uh, that uh, one has to make sure there is no infringement of copyrights but if this is published data then i think you can always draw the same data uh, afresh in a new uh, format and then you can use it but you must code code the source of the data but you cannot uh, legally use the same diagram which is published in a research paper unless you get a permission from the publisher and uh, you must be knowing that is another issue uh, on which again there is a report available on uh, insa website we give uh, money to the publishers we sweat and blood we give that to the publishers that paper is published and the copyright lies with the publisher uh, i think this is a different issue altogether so what uh, but coming to this main issue uh, we cannot take a picture uh from a published material directly and use it unless this is officially allowed uh thank you very much sir uh it was really very informative and a very well researched presentation uh and that that's why uh, we were expecting the same from you you are known for that kind of presentation uh, so yes as 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 per your reputation sir uh thank you very much sir uh, uh, uh i want to inform all these participants which are here uh that they can get uh the recording of the session after a post uh, 25th we will put these recordings on vigyan prasar's youtube channel so probably in new year you can go and you can find all these uh interesting discussions master class Uh, which we just had with sir on youtube channel of vigyan prasad uh, sir thank you very much it was really a honor having you here in the master class uh, thank you very much sir thank you so much and to all the audience and uh, my apology that in the beginning there was a technical glitch and so there was a delay uh, but i hope uh, it's compensated yes so sir much. it is yeah thank you very much sir so uh, uh, friends that was Uh, the master class uh, with uh, uh, very respected and 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 very famous dr c m notial program culture in science communication india national science academy new delhi uh, that it was on dealing with difficult themes of science videos and as i told you you can have uh, this uh, class recording later on on 
YouTube channel of uh, Vigyan Prasad. Uh, but before closing the session, I want to let you know that tomorrow, please don't miss our panel discussion, Science Films, The Way Forward. It, it will be an interactive session with the jury members where uh, Sri Mike Pandey, veteran filmmaker, environmentalist will chair. And then Dr. Mukesh Sharma, ex DJ Film Division, ex ADG Pudashan Mumbai, and Dean School of Branding and Advertising, NMIMS University Mumbai will, and Miss Usha Basin, ex ADG Pudashan, former consultant, the World Bank, uh, uh, Washington DC, Professor Dani Shikwal, AJKM MCRC, Jamia Amelia Islamia, New Delhi's professor. Sri Himansu Malhotra, wildlife filmmaker, New Delhi, Dr. Sunil Meru, joint director, CEC, UGC, New Delhi, uh, Miss Monica Gulati, producer, international broadcast, All India Radio, New Delhi, uh, Miss Meenakshi Damdi, Joshi, senior filmmaker and cinematographer, New Delhi, uh, and Dr. Shobhana Chaudhary, senior scientist, CSIR, HRDC, Ghaziabad, will be participating and it will be moderated by Miss Reema Kapoor Gautam, broadcaster. So, and after that, we will have the declaration of awards and validatory session that will be uh, attended by none other than Sri Shekhar Kapoor, veteran filmmaker, president, Film and Television Institute of India, FTII Society and Chairman, Governing Council of FTII. And the guest of honor will be Sri Mike Pandeji, veteran filmmaker, and virus lead, jury chairman, Inter International Science Film Festival of India 2020. So, uh, we hope to see you, all of you, tomorrow uh, morning at 11 o'clock uh, uh, in the panel discussion. Till then, have a great night. Good night. Good night, sir. Good night.